John chapter 15, if you're there, say I'm there. I want to welcome each and every one of you on this Pentecost Sunday. Perhaps some of you do not know what Pentecost Sunday is. Pentecost uh, in the New Testament is when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples uh, and filled them with the Holy Spirit. They spoke with other tongues. But in the Old Testament, Pentecost was when the, the law was given. Uh, and uh, before they had even given it, they were already breaking it. By the time Moses was getting down the mountain, they had already broken it. Very, very powerful uh, study if you really go into Pentecost in the Old Testament and Pentecost in the, in the New Testament and how the roles were reversed. In the Old Testament, Pentecost, the law was given, and therefore death almost. In the New Testament, the law, I mean the Spirit is given and life. Amen? Uh, so if you ever have an opportunity to, to go in deeper in that study, you'll be blessed to see those comparisons. God is an amazing God. Everything he does in his word, it, it's, it's significant. When you begin to study him, you begin to find out how intricate and how detailed God is in everything that he does. Amen? That's why in the world we're living in right now, we should not be surprised about what's going on. As if though some strange thing has come upon us. Didn't he tell us that? I don't think it's strange that these fiery trials have come upon you as if some strange thing has happened to you. And he tells us in his word, he, he reveals us his doings and what he's about to do. And there's no need for us to panic. There's no need for us to fear. Amen? Uh, that's why I say it's one of the greatest moments um, in time for the church. For the, for the church. The church, church. Amen? And let me, let me explain this a little bit. There was, a, I won't mention any names because you know exactly who it would be. Uh, church sent out a, a poll as to who felt comfortable coming back to church. This was like as recent as last week. And the church is in Texas. So Texas has been able to have church for a long time now. They sent out a poll. And he put the, the pie chart of the results of the survey on there, a graphic of it. And 79% of the church was uncomfortable going back to church. 16% said yes, they're comfortable going back to church. And 5% were undecided. And because of the 79%, he chose to not reopen. And in leadership, you, you, you learn a principle called the Pareto Principle. It's the 80-20 principle. 80-20. 20% of the church will always do 80% of the work. It almost seems like it was a perfect, perfect percentage. The 79 and 16 and the 5 undecided. 20% uh, will always do 80% of the work, will always give 80% of, of the givings, will always uh, pray 80% of the church prayer life. It's, it's 20%. And instead of opening up for his true church, right? So then the other 79 could jump on board also. Come on, because it's the whole is the church, but the 20% is the core going to drive you as a church. And instead of listening to the 20%, he listened to the 80%. Yeah. So Moses sends out spies, 10 spies, to come back with a positive report and the rest with a negative report about the promised land, even though God had already told them what to do. So what, does, what do they do? They listen to the 80% instead of the 20%. Had they listened to the 20% and all gone in, God would have brought victory to all, 100%. So you can't go by what the 80% says. You have to stick to the core 20% so that the other 80% can be blessed as well. But if you listen to the 80%, you're really stunting. 
the core of who you really are as a church. Amen. So I want to uh, just encourage you to always uh, seek God. Always make sure that you're that you're always pursuing God. Amen. That the Holy Spirit of God that we're, we're going to be talking about here in a little bit is always at the forefront of, of your life. Yes. Amen. Um, a few weeks ago, as, as people were beginning to come back to the church, I said, you know, you might hear things that I preach now that, that because you've been away, it might seem like I'm stepping on toes. That's not the case. As a pastor, I'm not here to step on people's toes. I'm here to encourage. Amen. I'm here to inspire. I'm here to build up. I'm here to motivate. So I'm never going to massage you where you're not supposed to be. Okay, I'm going to try to encourage you to come into where you're supposed to be. Amen. And sometimes that seems um, unsympathetic or insensitive. But that's not what I'm doing. I hope you know my heart. It's always to encourage you to come back into where you're supposed to be. One of the blessings that I saw in our church is that I still even haven't started preaching, so go ahead, keep standing. <laughs> is that because we stayed open as people were coming back from maybe being a little bit afraid or, or uh, cautious or whatever you want to call it, they came into a church that was already operating. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was easy for them to just shake off the fear. Amen. What I'm seeing other churches having a difficulty with is that because they they closed down and they all stayed away, everybody stayed at home, now they're coming back, now they're putting restrictions. You have to come in this way and not that way, you have to sit this far apart, wear masks, don't do this, if you feel sick, don't come. All kinds of restrictions. I'm afraid, I get anxious just listening to them explaining. I'm serious, I'm not even joking. I hear the pastors explain and video, and I get a little bit anxious, like, I don't know if I want to go there. And then they say, invite your friends. And I'm like, I don't even know if I'm going to go. <laughs> so could you imagine walking into that atmosphere already fearful? So now you got to try to pull them out of that fear. And I praise God that there was a remnant here that not only stood for themselves, but stood for those who may not have been in a certain level or for whatever reason couldn't be here so that when they came back, they could just step into the same anointing they stepped out of whenever they left. Amen? So we're here for one another. There's no individuals here. We are a body. We are a family. Come on, somebody. And we stand together. We stand together. All right, let me try to get into my message now. John 15 and verse 13. Are you there? John chapter 15 and verse No, that's not it Stop pasando Don't find it I know what the scripture is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I know what the scripture is. <laughs> Go with me to Galatians because I got another scripture. Go with me to Galatians. I know that the Lord is going to put it in my spirit. Yeah. Oh, I know what the problem is. I hope it's a last week's message, <laughs> which was the correct scripture for last week's message. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. I was like, this is not new. Wow. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Ahora sí. Are we ready? All right, here we go. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea 
and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Amen. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right. All right, cool. So I want to speak on the subject today, the wait is over. The wait is over. Somebody say, the wait is over. All right, look at your neighbor and tell them, the wait is over. Slap the neighbor behind you tell them, the wait is over. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be in your house. What a privilege. What an honor. What an opportunity, Lord, to be in your house today. I ask, Lord, that you bless us. I ask that you speak to us. Give us a word in season. As I speak, Lord, I pray that it be you and not me. Let me be merely the vessel that you use to pour yourself unto your people today and always. Lord, we pray in Jesus' precious, powerful, mighty name. And everyone said, Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord Almighty praise. And you may be seated. And because y'all took a long time, I'm going to have to. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we see the trouble going on in the world, don't we? Craziness going on in the world. But we are the church. The church has been one of the biggest undiscovered, untapped treasures. The biggest undiscovered, untapped resource or power ever known. Untapped. Undiscovered. Through the years, instead of increasing in strength, increasing in power, we seem to have retreated back into being an asymptomatic organism or entity. See, I've been learning stuff throughout these past couple of months. Asymptomatic. Amen. Which means it's showing no symptoms. The church has become asymptomatic. Showing no symptoms of ever being infected by the God of the universe. Come on now. We've seen in the past couple months opportunities for us to rise and shine and be a beacon and to be a power force, a resource to the world. And some have chosen to squander those opportunities. Because they've been asymptomatic. They've shown no signs, no symptoms of ever being infected by the God of the universe. Never being infected by the power of God that we read in the scriptures about. We read in the scriptures about this mighty God, about this powerful God, about this unlimited God. We read in the scriptures about this God who can do all things and anything and to him nothing is too hard. And says that with him we, even we can do Amen. all things. To us nothing shall be impossible by the yeah. Yet we show no symptoms. The church in general at large has shown no symptoms of knowing that God. I've ever been in, in close relationship to him. You know the disciples after Jesus had been crucified... Uh, the disciples would walk, walk around town doing stuff and, and people could sniff them out. They said, nah, you, you've been with them. I don't know who you are, but you've been with them. I smell it. Not that they could smell it, but they could detect it. You, you guys talk like it. Something about you that, that is telling on you that you've been with that man. They were symptomatic. They were showing symptoms that they had been with Jesus. That they had, they had contacted something from Jesus. Amen. That Jesus was very contagious. And they had caught whatever it is that he carried. Amen. But today it seems like the church is asymptomatic. Nobody knows that you've been walking with Jesus. Yeah. 
Church has been dormant, asleep, yeah. irrelevant due to an oversight. Yeah. An oversight, a failure to realize who it is, the church. It's, it's failed to realize and recognize who it, the church is. The church at large missed opportunity to discover and to operate in their true purpose and their true identity. Who is the church? It retreated back and allowed the world to force us into caves, to force us into hiding, to, to keep us from stepping out and operating in who God called us to be. I'm talking about the church at large. I'm not talking about you specifically. I don't know how God used you during this time. I don't know that. But I can see how God used the church at large. And I can see what the church at large did. And it was forced to stand aside while the world, the adults said, we'll take care of this. Children, go over there and play. Go to the other room and play. Get out of our way so that we can handle this situation. But the church was never be, supposed to be a child that was brushed aside. The church was supposed to be the adult in the room that said, don't worry, we got this. We'll take care of this. Everything is going to be all right. I heard things, well, we're going to wait till it's safe. Open back up. Come on. And I've used it as an analogy, and I'll keep using it until it ceases to be relevant. But I said, do you never send Marines out to a battle and the Marines turn back and look at you and say, we're going to wait till it's safe to go in there. <laughs> no, they would cease to be the Marines. The reason they're out there is because it's the Marines. Because they're the Marines. That's who you send out when it's not safe. We're the church. That's who you send out when it's not safe. Thank you, Lord. I'm just in my intro. I should, you know, settle down a little bit. We fail to realize who we are. And all of a sudden, they're coming out now and preaching, hey, we got to be bold. So you ask, what is that for me? Come on. Come on now. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Jesus was assembled with them. The Bible says Jesus was assembled with these guys. That's what it says. It says that being assembled together with them. Jesus was assembled with them. Jesus, and being assembled together with them. Sometimes we fail to recognize that Jesus is assembled together with us. Yes. Or is he? We come into this place and we praise and worship. And the Bible says that when we praise and worship, that God abides in the midst of the praise of his people. So that when two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. So God enters into this place and abides with us and gathers with us and assembles with us. Every time we come together or when you're at, the, uh, at your Bible study or when you're at home with your family around the table and two of you touch and agree and you know that God is with you because when two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. And you know that God is there. But we fail to recognize that Jesus assembles together with us when we assemble. We left him out of the equation. When facing the difficulties, when facing the turmoil, when, when facing the struggle, we left him out of the equation. We forgot that when we gather, he's assembled with us. And Jesus was assembled there. He was gathered there with him. Sometimes we forget that he is with us because He's not invited. And we begin to set up programs and we begin to plan this and plan that and we put this arrangement here and that arrangement there and we adjust the right temperatures and we adjust the right lights and the, the sound system is on point. Everything sounds good. We check all the angles, make sure that the sound is not bouncing from here and there and the decibels are just right and the cushions are just right. And everything's perfect! Except you forgot to invite Jesus. We got coffee imported from Colombia. We got the best coffee in town. 
بس عاطف يا هي ما تشوفش الزهر. Well, we forget to invite Jesus. Most important element of church, we forget. So not, always make sure that when we assemble, we're together in his name. Yeah. Don't ever just assemble. Yeah. When you assemble, assemble in his name. For where two or three are gathered together in his name, yeah. there I am in the midst of them, he says. So he's gathered there with them. In that gathering, he commands them. The Bible says he commanded them. He gave them instruction. He gave instruction. Don't you dare come to church and leave without instruction. Come on. Amen. We come to church. We gather together and he assembles with us. Whenever we come together and we assemble and God assembles with us, He's going to speak to us. He's going to instruct us. Don't you ever walk out of these doors without instruction. You just wasted an hour of your time. Because we don't go longer than an hour. <laughs> so you always leave with instruction. When people give me feedback about what God spoke to them in a service, it blesses my heart. I'm like, wow, look at what God did there. Praise God, God gave revelation, God moved, God gave instruction. When you leave this place every Sunday, you should type out what it is that God spoke to you through that message. Amen. Right? You can inbox it to me if you want, or you can put it in your journal if you want. But always write down what God spoke to you through the message. Y si están por puertas, I'll correct you. Y no está poniendo nada pensando. Come on now. So always write it down. What God, what were the instructions that God gave you? What did God say to you? Because as believers, we believe that every time we come through these doors, God is going to speak to us. How many of you in here walk out of this place full of what God tells you, full of what God is saying, and how He's leading you and guiding you? You leave with instruction when you leave from the house of God. It happens in the gathering, and He's assembled there and He starts commanding. What a blessing, what an opportunity. I would come to church, I want to come to church, and I want to gather with people with the expectation of God getting ready to speak to me. An expectation that God is getting ready to command me something. Every time I go to church, I'm anxious and I'm excited rather and anticipating the word of God that he's about to speak to me. And I don't care who's speaking. Some of you, you can't hear some people and ask, you know, I'm going to preach again. I ain't going to preach that. Blah, 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 blah. You know, every time I'm going to hear, what is, what is it, Lord, that you want to tell me? If God has placed me in that service, that means he's going to speak to me through whoever it is that he's placed there to speak. And I always walk away with something that God gives me. And that he's instructed me or commanded me. Because in the gathering, God will command, he'll instruct will speak to you. Amen? That's what this is. That's what this is, the gathering with Christ. It's like children gathering around with daddy and he's getting ready to speak to you and give you instructions and lay hands on you to bless you and to send you on your way. You have to sit there with, with attentiveness in your eyes and in your ears ready to receive what your father has to say to you. Amen. He begins to command them and says, Wait! For the promise of the Father. He says, wait. But he was saying to stay where you are until a particular time. Or until something else happens. So he tells them, I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. The disciples were eager to go. They were eager to go out and begin to tell people about what they had seen and heard and experienced with Christ. The miracles and the laying on of hands and the walking of water and the multiplication of the bread and, and the fish and loaves. And, and they wanted to go tell about the blind eyes open and, and the lepers healed. They wanted to go and talk about all that. They were eager to go. And God tells them, wait. Jesus says, wait for the promise of the Father. They were to wait for something. Wait for something. Position yourself and wait for something. For the promise of the Father. 
So before he sends out the church, before he sends out the disciples to go tell the story and to go testify and to go witness, he says, wait, don't go just yet. Because if you go now, you're going to go without something that is crucial for you to be successful and effective in what I'm sending you out to do. You have to recognize that you're just not any entity. You're just not any group of people. <coughs> I'm getting ready to change that for you. So you have to wait until something happens. What was that something? He says, until the promise, you gotta wait for the promise of the Father. What was that promise of the Father? Well, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, Jesus tells them what the promise of the Father is. He says, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Amen. So this is the promise of the Father, that they would be endued with power from on high. He says, before you go out and witness and testify and tell of everything that you've seen and heard, I have to empower you. I have to endue you with power from on high. Because what I'm sending you out to do needs yes. power behind yes. it. I have to empower you with power from on high so that you can be successful at what you're doing. Yes. You're not doing just any other ordinary thing. In other words, he says, you, you're not just a social club. You're just not a nice group to be part of. You are going to be a force needing to be reckoned with. Amen. You are going to be a force that is going to flip cities upside down. The Bible says that they turn cities upside down. You are going to be a force that is going to change things, that's going to bring transformation, that is going to strip people, strip souls from the grips and the grasp of the enemy, from the pits of hell, and you're going to pull them out into the light of God. You are going to be a force to be reckoned with. You're not just going to be mere men and mere women. You're going to be something different. And I am separating you from that. And don't you ever think that you're just mere people, mere men, mere women. You are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. He said, my very own particular special people. You are not just anybody. You are not just some group that is insignificant and not important and can be brushed aside. No, there's going to be power upon you, but you have to wait for it. It's going to come upon you. And once it comes upon you, you're going to go power from on high. And he says, which you have heard from me. He said, I told you that this was going to happen. I told you that power was coming. That the promise of the Father is that he was going to empower you with power from on high. You don't have natural power. You have power from on high. You don't have ordinary wisdom. You have wisdom from on high. Amen. You don't have ordinary natural resources. You have resources from on high. Amen. Brothers and sisters, do you know where your help comes from? Amen. This is who we are, the church. And he says, you've heard it from me. I said it. Don't, don't be pointing fingers and criticizing Pastor Joel. Don't be putting ugly comments at, uh, at Pastor Joel. He's just saying what you heard me say. Amen. No, 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 we thought say it. No, no. He says, you heard me say it. Why are you surprised? Why are you leery? Why are you doubtful? You heard me say, did you not? Come on, church. Amen. 2020, we got to start seeing clearly. Right. 2020, God, a need shows up and God says, all right, church, sick them. 
And the church says, I must be. I put a while, no, it was wow. And God says, go get him, come on, go get him. And we're like, hmm. I, but what did it do to us? Come on now. God says, come on, go, go get them. Yeah. I'm sure that's what God was saying when all the Israelites were in battle array. And Goliath comes down, set me a man that I may fight with him. And whoever wins will be servants to the others. And there was all kinds of Philistines up on the ridge, up on the mountain saying, man, if Goliath whips them, then we're all coming and feasting on all the rest. He shows up a giant and says, oh, if this giant whoops them, then all of the other demons can come in and feast on the remnants of what used to be the church. But send me a man, he says, and David shows up. And God says, somebody got to go. Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. Amen. David said, Lord, here am I, send me. Don't let any of their hearts fail them. Uh, King Saul, I'll go. Amen. I'll go. And he went and he says, I come at you. And listen, he's, he didn't say, man, I got this sling here and stones. I thought best style. I've used it before. Man, I'm good. I'm coming at you. I'm like, nope. Nope. He understood where his resource came from. He understood where his power came from. And he says, you come at me with sword, shields, and spears, but I come at you in the name of the Lord of hosts. He is with me, and I'm about to feed your carcass to the beast of the field, the birds of the air. He knew who he was, not because of himself because of the God that was living on the inside of him. He, he wasn't much himself. The man looks at him and says, you sent him to me. What am I, a dog? Sending this boy out here with a stick? He felt insulted because David didn't look like much. The church sometimes doesn't look like much. We don't have to look like much. We have to be much. There has to be much on the inside of us. Somebody. So it doesn't matter how, how beautiful you look and how amazing you look, if there's no power on the inside of you, then there's a problem. Because everybody who looked like warriors and had all the right armor on, they were up on the ridge. The one that didn't look like much, the one everybody forsook and nobody thought much of, I'm in the day Go back to the fathers, your father's few sheep. He said, No way. This guy is defying the armies of the living God. Got to go in the power of my God. Stand in the gap and be his vessel. And that's what he did. Because God said, he was walking around with what God said. They were walking around looking at the circumstances. He was walking around with what God said. Amen. We can't be walking around with the circumstances. We got to be walking around with what God said. Amen. We don't have to be depending on all our resources. We have to be depending that God said something. Amen. And if God said it, the Bible says that He is faithful to perform whatever it is that He said. I want to let you know that if God has promised you something, you can stand on that word, you can stand on that promise because He is faithful to perform whatever it is that He promised. So when you read the scripture and you see what God says, you can stand on His word and you can be confident in whatever it is that you say and confess what God has spoken to you and stay steadfast. Stand on the confession of your faith. Be bold and very courageous. Be strong and of good courage. Hallelujah. Joshua, God tells Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Yeah. Be strong and good courage. Be strong and very courageous. God keeps telling him that. You know, if somebody told me that, I start wondering. <laughs> what do you know? You're not telling me here. No, no, don't worry about it. Just be strong and very, very courageous. No, you're going to be all right. Just be strong and very...
very courageous. Don't tell weakness. Be bold, okay? Look, look it up. Yeah, just be strong, all right? But no, he didn't just say that. He, he, he said, make sure that the words of this law, this book, do not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. He says, remember what I have said. And if you remember what I have said, you can march into troubles, you can march into difficulties, you can march into battle with my word, and you'll be strong and of good courage. You'll be very courageous, and you'll walk into the promises that I have laid out, set out for you. Be able to walk into Praise the name of Jesus. Power from on high. David knew that he didn't have to depend on his stature. He had to depend on the stature of the God whom he served. The God in whose name he walked into battles with. Not only would he face giants, he faced nations of giants. Because he kept, he kept moving from faith to faith and from glory to glory. He moved from lions and, and bears to Goliath to, to armies of giants. You with me? He says, I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John talked about it. He said, you're going to be baptized with fire. He's going to baptize you with fire. He says, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So they asked. The disciples asked him, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? Is this, is this when it's going to happen? You're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They were confused about purpose. Like, is, is, is this when you're going to make everything nice and lovely and everything's going to be good? Is that what you're going to do it? And Christ is like, I'm going to give you power from on high. Amen. Yeah, you're asking me if I'm going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Why would I be giving you power from on high if I was going to restore everything and make it to where you wouldn't need any power. That's right. If I'm going to give you power, it means that I'm about to launch you all out into something that you're going to need power from on high for. Not just power, but power from on high you're going to need. Come on, church. I know I didn't tell you this when, when I asked you if you wanted to get saved. But God is going to send you out there into situations that you are going to be needing of power from on high. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. So they were confused about purpose. The thinking was too small. Couldn't understand why they needed power. So they asked him, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He says, it's not for you to know the things that my father has Place under his authority. It's not for you to know those things. It, it is not necessary for you to know everything that God is doing. Brothers and sisters, I'm, tell, I'm here to tell you, it's not necessary for you to know everything that God is doing. But I want to know it, it's not necessary. Thank you. Are you with me? Amen. You got to just trust that he knows what he's doing. And you have to be able to take instruction one step at a time. As much as he gives, you take. As much as he gives, you do. Wait here for the promise of the Father. Okay, yes sir. But is that what you're wondering? Stop! <laughs> Don't we do that? How many times do you think God has to say, Just wait! It's not for you to know. And I'm here to tell you, brothers, this is not necessary for you to know everything that God is doing. God does reveal to his church, he reveals to his prophets things that he's doing in the secret. But there's some things that he, nobody's going to know That's right. about what he's doing. Hallelujah. Don't base your service to the Father on whether or not you know everything. That's wrong. Don't, don't base whether you'll go out or not. On whether you know if it's safe or not, or, or if you know all the details of the assignment. Don't, don't, don't wait. Don't base your service on that. If God tells you to go, and you don't know all the details, it's, it's uncertain, it's unsure, you don't even know if you'll come back from it. If God tells you to go, you have to go. 
Come on now. Pastor, calmate, Pastor. Que tanto, que tanto, man, church. God is putting in my spirit so so much that the church needs needs to be aware of how to confront the issues that are coming in this world. Amen. How to confront the Antichrist spirit. Yes. And if we're not ready, we're going to go under quick. I know. It, well, a few months ago, this preacher would have been a high pastor. But now we recognize that it could be days from now. It could be weeks from now. Right? Now it's not so far-fetched. So we have to be ready for the Antichrist spirit that's already in the world, the Bible says. But it's going to begin to rise up and it's going to begin to move more. And the church has to be solidified in what they believe. The church has to be solidified in understanding that they have received power from on high. In order for them to be able to stand boldly and to be who God has called them to be. Hallelujah. You with me? God will put you in strange, uncertain, risky, dangerous, uncomfortable places where you're not sure what God is doing. I was talking to a friend of mine last night, and he's ex-military. He told me that he was up in the riots uh, in uh, Minneapolis. He lives out there. He says, I mean, I was 100 feet from the, from the power of the, of, the, of the protest, he said. But I was there. It was dangerous. I took my body on it. But I was able to find this Jewish single mother. And God allowed me to minister to her. And he said, he, I was able to talk about the Messiah to her. Come on now. He left her in his body armor and left her encouraged, told her about Christ. But what if he had been that type of, I'm going over here. I don't think of negocios. I mean, I'm not saying go get in the middle of the riots. I'm just saying when God tells you to go somewhere, no matter where it is, you better get ready to go. We don't clap because we're like, hey, I'm in my house, Pastor, because I, I mean, I got a family, I got a wife, I got a good job, I just bought my new truck. I mean, I get in my spot. I mean, come on, Pastor. You with me? Yeah. I'm saying it. I'm bringing it to this point because we're so in love with insignificant things. And we're so hesitant to go after what God tells us to do because it might take us out of our comfort zone. Because it's a little unsure. It's a little uncertain. He says, he says, it's not for you to know. Okay? This is what God, this is what he says. It's not for you to know. I might send you into uncertain places, into strange places, into uncomfortable places, into scary places. I might send you into those things. But he says, but, but, you shall receive power. Yeah. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He says, I'm getting ready to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He says, you're going to restore the kingdom? You're going to do this? He says, not for you to know everything. I might send you into some crazy places. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Oh, sisters, we're not going out there uncovered. We're not stepping into danger zone uncovered. We've got the Spirit of God. We've got the power of God living on the inside of us, operating in us. Yeah, that's some that's some weak stuff. I don't know, y'all got good back up in here, some plotting or something. Not for me. Come on. But for the fact that God said you shall receive power yeah. after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Listen to that. Listen to that, church. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you and then he says, You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and to the end of the earth. He said, you're going to go places. I'm going to send you into places. I want you to wait right now because I want to send you the promise of the Father, which was the power from on high. He says, I'm going to empower you. I'm going to release power upon your life. 
And upon this thing we call the church, this body we call the church, I'm going to release power from on high. And then I'm going to say, you're going to be witnesses for me. Amen. You're going to go and tell about me and tell about the power that you've seen me operate in. You're going to tell about the power that is living on the inside of you. But the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living on the inside of you. He says, you're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. You're going to trample on serpents and scorpions and they shall by no means harm you. You're going to do some great things for me and there's going to be power that's going to be released in all you're doing. And you're going to be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and Samaria. And what does he say? And to the end of the earth. Then Acts, we enter into the next chapter, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and suddenly, and suddenly, on the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them tongues, divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Power came down upon the church on that day of Pentecost, brothers and sisters, and it has never left. God has never taken His power back. upon you, upon me, upon the church in general, at large. Power has come upon us. It's not time for us to be hiding in our homes. It's not time for us to be pinpointing through life. It's time for us to rise up and be the church that God has called us to be. If not now, then when? If not now, then when? The power of God has come upon us, church. So now, the question is, what are you waiting for? What well, Jesus told you, yeah, he told you to wait until the promise came. But the promise came. Came upon the disciples, came upon the church, has come upon you and has come upon me. We are that same church that was in that upper room and that same spirit that came down upon them is upon us. He's raised Wait is over. Wait is over. 